If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Uh, because I believe that somebody who's never heard of Jesus Christ can also be saved. How can they be saved? Because Jesus was the salvation of all mankind, and why should he condemn somebody to hell who's never heard of him? It doesn't make sense. So therefore, it is your opinion that uh, those... Because God is not limited to the church. God is bigger than the church. Okay, so but you don't see baptism as essential at all. I think it is very, very important. But I can't see condemning to hell all the men and women who have lived since Christ on continents that they never even heard of Jesus because mm -hmm. nobody preached to them. And that I don't feel comfortable with that. When Paul says in Romans, where sin did abound, grace did more abound. Mm -hmm. uh, Does that mean other religions such as Islam? Sure. And uh, that worship Allah? Uh, they, since they haven't heard about Christ, they would still go to heaven? Yeah. Pagan, uh, pagan worshipers also? The worship idols and stuff like that that haven't heard about Christ. They would go that are living in good faith to their idols. To whatever. Okay. Neither sanctity nor salvation can be found outside the Holy Catholic Apostolic Roman Church. Pope Pius the Ninth. Rome has spoken. The case is closed. Would that error too might someday be over and done with. Augustine. Before everything else, fidelity to the church, one holy Catholic and apostolic. Jesus did not found several churches, but one single church, Pope John the Twenty-Third. All your life, you've felt opposite. Have you ever read this? I mean, I've read documents like it, but uh, no, I have no problem with that. Uh, okay, you disagree with it. I know, as a Roman Catholic, I know the bishop would say the same thing if he was here this morning, mm -hmm. that we do not limit salvation to Roman Catholics. Okay. There's no question about that. Okay. We do not condemn Jews to hell, Muslims to hell. You know, an individual person can choose to lead a deliberately evil life on that basis. They can reject God. Okay. But, uh, no, just because they don't fit into a denomination, that doesn't make sense. Do you feel that a person, uh, quite apart from the Roman Catholic question, do you feel that a person can go to heaven apart from a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ on any place on this planet? Definitely. Could you cite the book or chapter or verse <coughs> or just generally anywhere, and I have the Roman Catholic Bible that I'll loan you that you can use to show me where it teaches that in the Bible. I'm not limited to the Bible, Rob. We knew that before we even started the show. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute, if we could, okay? You say that you're not limited to the Bible. What then is your source of authority? The Bible, tradition, common sense, reason. Okay. Which would uh, take preeminence? Which would have sway they all work together. one over the other? Pardon me? They all work together. Uh, Okay, in what sense can the statement that a person can go to heaven apart from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, where does the Bible fit into that statement if logic, reason, history, tradition, all that? Which because the Bible the teaches that God is good, that God loves all men and women, and that it goes against the God's mercy and justice to condemn somebody to hell who has lived a good life. Where does it say that in the scripture, that it goes against God's justice? The scripture says that God is good. Yes, he is. He is And good. just. And, and merciful. Just. Right. No way. But in, in order to jump from God is good to God wouldn't send anybody to hell who's living a good life, wouldn't we want to support that with some intervening scriptural basis? And I would ask you to do that if you could. I, mean, I might say God is good, Therefore, the devil himself goes to heaven. God is good, therefore, 
the worst mass murder in the world finds mercy and goes. No, to but you're def you're equating the worst mass murder or the devil with an innocent three-year-old child. No, I'm not. I'm. Let's just. You uh, are in what you just said. Yeah, and that's nonsense. Let's let's equate uh, God is good with the average person who is working in America today, and he's involved in the religion of his choice. Let's say a Buddhist, and he chants three times a day, and he holds a, a job at the the local industry. Uh, do you feel that he would find peace with God and go to heaven? Yes. You said... Now how did the thief on a cross do that? He was suffering, and he gave an absolute uh, act of faith, and he... W he, he and he was dead a few hours later. Yeah, he acknowledged... He didn't have to go to purgatory or anything. Where does the Catholic Church teach that every person who dies has to go to purgatory? Where does it teach that? Wait a minute now. The question is... They teach purgatory. Here's a thief on a cross. But he all right, a, he didn't he need to go to guy. purgatory. Where does Why the not? Catholic Church teach that every person who dies has to go to purgatory? Well, how come they have to go at all? Is my question. Some people do. Some people don't. Are because you, that nothing sounds a little unfair to me. How come a crummy thief on a cross who lived a crummy life and in a couple hours before he dies, he makes profession he had a and pure, he gets to go right to heaven? He had a pure act of faith. He had a pure act of faith. So that absolved his... him from a whole life of sin and evil. That's right. Just like that. That's right. That's the power of God's grace, right? But there's other guys that are in the Catholic Church all their life, and they have to go to purgatory, and they need masses said for them, which is also another gospel, by the way, and the whole doctrine of transubstantiation is a blasphemy. But, well, uh, listen, you do not believe in the Church of the New Testament or the Apostolic Church, because if you want to make fun of a blessed Eucharist, which is the body and blood of Jesus Christ then you are the blasphemer because it is scriptural that Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. It is scriptural that he said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you shall not have life within you. So you can conveniently push aside scriptures that don't suit you. Okay. And if you look in the Apostolic Fathers, it was clear if you go to the Didache, if you go to St. Ignatius, you go to St. Clement of Rome, it is clear that the Eucharist was celebrated and that they understood it not just as a symbol, not just as a remembrance meal, but making real the very body and blood the of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Encyclopedia Britannica says a lot of your church fathers, like uh, Ignatius, have spurious documents and inter interpolations in them, and they're unreliable, so you really don't know what they really said anyway. But See, that's where our interpretation is different. We're, we're talking two Gospels here. You believe a certain set of beliefs passed down to you by, I think, an apostate church that had its candlestick removed according to uh, Revelation 2.5 a long time ago, oh. as all the Reformers testified. You know yourself with Calvin and Luther and Zwingli and Knox and all those well, they guys. All dis they disagree among themselves. So is this But the they all agreed that the, the Roman Catholic oh, yeah. Church was the Antichrist. It was a harlot church. The great whore of Babylon, a lot of them said, and, and uh, you know, was... And I wonder what if they were wrong, and that well, is... Well, they'll the be all right, because uh, if the Muslims and the Buddhists and, and the Hindus can be saved... Let, let's just pursue this. Uh, would you, you... God desires all people to be saved and All come types to know, of people. How do you know it means that? How do you know it doesn't? You don't have an authoritative interpretation on oh, that Oh, yes, verse. I do. The it's interpretation Who? of the Catholic Church. Hold it. You said only a few verses in the Bible. I did not say that. You said that. Hold it. Now, you go back and listen to the minute. I did not. I'm sorry to get angry. Remember I said But you are verses? so skilled, sir, at putting words in our mouth and a bearing false witness. Are you interested in truth or not? I am. That's why I'm trying to get it out of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're not doing a very good job. All you're doing is giving slurs and distortions and if you're really interested in what the Catholic Church teaches, you would listen more carefully instead you, of saying, this is not what you believe when I clearly read from our own sources. Do you believe Karl Rahner? I mentioned him earlier. He's not, he's not the authority of the Catholic Church. Is he Church. more of an authority than you are? No more, because he's a, he's a private theologian. He's a private theologian? He's no more of an authority than I am. He, he wrote theological investigations. So what? R Luther wrote a lot of books. You know what Doesn't volume 11, page 247 says? All right, read it. It's, uh, it's concerning the sin of Adam, and it'll go on in here. He says, the most striking feature of the situation which exists today, which exists today for an ecumenical discussion of the sin of Adam is that neither on the Protestant or the Catholic side is there any theology on this theme which could be presented uh, simply as the Protestant position or the Catholic position. And he goes on to say how there's a lot of 
uh, verses in the scripture that simply are, there is no authoritative interpretation by the church. And he goes on to say he's concerned about giving an interpretation, particularly on Romans 5, verses 12 through 21 here, because he doesn't want to make that sin, basically, of a private interpretation. And then there's, do you know someone in town named, uh, oh, what's her name here? Uh, Delane D. Eckberry here in town? She, I've heard of her. Now, what's yeah, your point? She's a, she's a Roman Catholic uh, person here in town, too. But she, she basically says that, concerning the Eucharist, as we we're talking about, that there are, uh, there's 56 million Catholics in the United States, and they all give 56 million interpretations of the mystery of the Eucharist. That's, so, the, she'd have which a hard, all are, all she'd are equally valid. She'd have a hard valid. time establishing that. Let's just okay. get back to the I'm Bible. I'm just reading your own people. No. They, they would agree yeah, with but me. But neither of them, neither okay. of them speaks on behalf. You deny your own people. Okay. No. Go ahead. Well... an extended sense, the body of Christ and the church is everyone that's been created by God. So he's in talking here about the worshipers sense. of Athena or any other pagan religion. Well, and, 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 God, God can do whatever he wishes. So these superabundant works can be transferred from, let's say, some uh, like Mother Teresa. We could take her example. Yeah. She's probably got more than enough, I would uh, I'd assume you would agree with. Yeah. And then those could be transferred to maybe some Hindu monk that needs them so he can attain his salvation according to Vatican II, volume one, page 70. Well, if it, it, does, it wouldn't hurt to pray for someone, to pray that God's mercy be, be given to someone. What's wrong with that? Now, now, now well, here's uh, the What's thing, because we're debating on, is this the true gospel? I, and we brought it up in other debates, but to me, and I know you're fascinated with too, and I, I want to bring it up on my chart here about who speaks for Rome, and then have your comments on this, because I don't think you've okay. uh, been exposed well, well, to Well, Larry, before we switch, let me just read to you a few scriptures that indicate that there is uh, a merit for what we do. St. Well, Paul, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, As you sow, so also shall you reap. And those who sow sparingly shall reap sparingly. Not for salvation. Now, uh, then Romans 2, 6 through 8, God will repay everyone according to his works. Eternal life to those whose work proves to be uh, good work. I'd have to look it up, but I just, that's the main point I wanted to get across. But and, as you understand then, from biblical theology, it's not their works, though, uh, that they're rewarded. It's through the blood of Christ, by their faith in Christ, that they were saved. Yeah. And then after they were saved, uh, the forensic justification, well, then they did works in Christ, and uh, God will reward them on that sense. Not that they'll attain salvation for those yeah. works. But no, no, but it just says in Romans 2.6, uh, he says, God who will repay everyone according to his works, eternal life to those who seek glory, honor, and immorality through perseverance in good works, but wrath and fury to those who selfishly disobey the truth and obey wickedness. So here, what we do, how we respond with our free will to the grace of God and uh, whether or not our faith is completed by good works, as James teaches, as Matthew 25 seems to indicate, as Paul himself clearly indicates in 1 Corinthians 13, that is crucial to our salvation. Well, let me tie that to what you just stated then in with, uh, you know, as I'm trying to get it back to the subject I want to bring up. Okay, as you've stated before, you can believe basically anything of any religion and can be saved, not necessarily will be saved. Yeah. But you believe end, you can be saved being in a completely, let's say you're in a religion that uh, to no, no fault of your own, you were raised in some uh, voodoo witch doctor sect. And maybe you have a uh, baby sacrifice once a, a, a year down in a, the Amazon River to the crocodiles. And uh, you're doing this year after year and then you live and die. And, now, would you consider, from the, based on the verse you just read a minute ago, that God would judge them, even though they're sincere in their religion, that this would be a vile act by killing a baby in a human sacrifice, sacrifice it to their gods and say that might be the alligators. Well, certainly uh, that type of uh, primitive violent religion uh, would not be the ground of their salvation. So, uh, so that, but they, could, they can still be saved, though. That's not, I'm just, I'm just repeating what is taught at Vatican II, that those who through no fault to their own do not know the gospel of Jesus Christ or his church but move by grace, strive by their deeds to do God's will as it is known to them in the dictates of conscience. And you know in the radio exchange, Romans 2.25 is crucial there, 
One could also appeal to John 12:47. Well, you ought to read Romans 2:12 and 2:16 for context. Well, what you've just heard is a debate that took place between Dr. Robert Fastigi of St. Edward's Catholic University and Larry Wessels, myself, speaking. This debate uh, covered uh, whether the Roman Catholic gospel was the gospel found in the Bible. And uh, as you heard there, I, I was mentioning the fact that the Roman Catholic doctrine of supererogation ties in with superabundant merits that can be transferred such as from uh, Mother Teresa to a Buddhist monk <laughs> or to someone else, and that will actually help them in their uh, attain of salvation. But uh, basically I played this little clip from this debate, which is available through our ministry, uh, just to kind of wake up the listener immediately, uh, let them know that what they hear in an actual debate with Roman Catholic theologians, maybe Roman Catholic clerics, is a lot different than what you may get from organizations such as, let's say, Catholic Answers with Carl Keating, or from, uh, let's say, evangelical organizations that actually defend Roman Catholicism. When you're actually debating authentic Roman Catholic theologians, professors, and clerics, you find that their uh, theology is in stark contrast to what an evangelical Christian would understand. Well, anyway, uh, this tape is going to be an analysis of CRI, that's the Christian Research Institute, on Romanism, part two. We had previously, that's Jim Tungate and myself, had done a tape called Analysis of CRI on Romanism, uh, and that tape had, had been one of the uh, best-selling tapes that the ministry ever had. And like uh, any successful movie might be, we decided to do a sequel because obviously people are, are definitely interested in this topic. And uh, to help me do this tape, the Lord has granted me uh, once again Jim Tungate to be with us. Jim? Greetings. It's good and, to be here again. And also uh, theologian, master of theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, lecturer, debater, writer, Rob Zins. Hello, Larry. Nice to be here with you. Excellent. Well, it's it's uh, truly an honor to have you gentlemen here with me as we get ready to go into an odyssey of Bible Answer Man shows that CRI puts out nationwide. And we're going to analyze what they're telling a nationwide audience, actually an international audience, because they also have radio outreaches into Canada and maybe around the world in not too uh, distant future. But uh, we're going to analyze various CRI radio clips and uh, then make our comments based on what we've heard on those clips. And so it'll be much in the same tradition as you've heard before on, uh, on C analysis of CRI on Romanism part one. And so with that, let us go on with the show, as I said before in the other tape. We'll do it once again. We'll start getting into some Bible Answer Man shows that touch on this issue of Roman Catholicism. And for our first tape, I'd like to go to a Bible Answer Man show of January the 10th, 1994, where Hank Hanegraaff, the president of CRI, had a special guest, Norman Geisler, uh, to to be with him as they discussed the issue of Roman Catholicism. Although the main issue was supposed to be about uh, Islam, uh, it seems that Hank Hanegraaff could not uh, resist the opportunity to uh, engage uh, Dr. Geisler in a conversation on Romanism. So uh, let us go to that tape, and then we will analyze uh, what's said. Uh, you've watched this ministry over a period of time. Uh, can you assure our listeners that I have not sold out to the Vatican or given up on the Christian faith? Well, whenever you're doing something good for God, you're going to be attacked. I'm an incurable optimist. I say when things are prospering, the Lord is blessing, and when uh, things aren't, the uh, devil is attacking. But seriously, I, I don't know of any other ministry like this anywhere in the world. I don't know of any other ministry that calls it the way they see it, that looks at issues and says, I don't care if this is outside in the culture, inside in the church, if this is unorthodox doctrine, uh, you're speaking uh, on it. And I commend you, and as you know, my name 
is proudly on the back cover of that book, Christianity in Crisis. As I recall, in the first edition, anyway, my name was the only name on the back cover of that book because I was thoroughly acquainted with this issue and I knew what you were saying, though it sounded extreme to many people, was absolutely right on, and I commend you for it and CRI for taking a stand on it. Perhaps one other thing that bears uh, a statement from you, uh, particularly uh, with those that uh, know you well. Uh, you have followed this ministry, and it's been around for 33 years, and there are those who are making the charge against me that uh, uh, that uh, I have abdicated or departed from the views that uh, Dr. Martin held on uh, such uh, issues as Roman Catholicism, uh, Catholicism etc. How would you respond to that? Well, my response to it is uh, then uh, let them make the same attacks uh, against me because I hold the same views. Uh, number two, uh, you hold the same views as Dr. Martin did. He considered that it was not a heretical position, that Roman Catholicism had not officially denied any major uh, doctrine of the Christian faith. And number three, wait until they see our book on Roman Catholics and Evangelicals that's coming up because that's exactly the position we're defending in the book. And I have spent a lifetime, I have a PhD from Roman Catholic University, and I can guarantee you from studying the original documents and knowing Catholicism on the inside that the view that Walter Martin took and that you take on this program is the correct view, and the people who say it isn't simply don't know what they're talking about. Well, let me ask you this question. Uh, there are people out there, and they're well-meaning, uh, who believe that Roman Catholicism is apostate because they see the aberrations uh, of Roman Catholicism, not only in our culture, but other cultures as well. And we have often uh, answered that criticism by simply saying that we have more in common with an Orthodox Catholic than we have a liberal Protestant. Uh, is that a good analogy? You took in your the words right out of my mouth. If you hadn't said that, that was already the answer formulated in my mind to your question. Uh, we do have more in common with Orthodox uh, Catholicism than we do with liberal Protestantism. It's an absolute shame that we should be a attacking these people, many of whom are born-again uh, Christians, sincerely fighting the same issues that we are, abortion, homosexuality in our society, that we have more in common with doctrinally, we both believe, I'm talking about Roman Catholics now, virgin birth, deity of Christ, substitution of atonement, bodily resurrection, second coming of Christ, uh, all of inspiration of the Bible. Now, those are all the fundamentals. By our classic definition of fundamentalists, somebody who believes in those five or six fundamentals, Roman Catholics are fundamentalists. Why should we be attacking them rather than liberal who deny all five or six of them. Yeah, and uh, we, in, in, in the same breath, would affirm the fact that uh, in uh, our estimation, Roman Catholics have a very confused uh, position with regards to soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. And I'm writing a couple articles on that. Uh, uh, my uh, co-author and I, uh, Ralph McKinsey, uh, are writing some uh, uh, chapters on that in the book, and it's going to be published in the uh, CRI Journal uh, coming up to elaborate that. But let me say that there are ships passing in the night there. They don't understand the nuances, the intricacies of the Roman Catholic view. Roman Catholics believe that salvation is by grace. They do not believe that you But not saved. by faith alone. But not by faith alone, but it's the kind of faith that produces good works, and so do we believe that. And once you define what they are saying and define what we're saying and get the semantical problem pushed aside, there is not that much difference even on that one. There are some differences, and they are important, and we bring them out in part two of our book. Uh, we don't believe in infallibility of the Pope. We don't believe in purgatory. We don't believe in transubstantiation. We don't believe in... Uh, uh, hyperdulia of Mary, the veneration of Mary. We don't believe in, in uh, bowing down before uh, images, and there are a lot of things where we differ. But let's be honest, on the areas that we don't differ, let's just agree to disagree agreeably. We don't uh, agree with everything other Protestants say, or Anglo-Catholics, or uh, for that matter, myself as uh, from the Baptistic tradition, is what Lutherans say. I mean, Lutherans believe in uh, baptismal regeneration, Roman Catholics do. Now, obviously, millions of Catholics Catholics are lost, as are millions of Protestants. So the real issue here is to reach the lost and not to repel them. And the way that we're trying to do this, and listen to me carefully, folks, is to carefully and accurately and honestly represent what official Catholic doctrine says. We recognize that there are all kinds of aberrations. I've said on this program that if you go to Brazil and you take the average Catholic and undress them metaphorically, you find a spiritist. So we are not 
simply saying that all Roman Catholics are believers and they're all going to heaven. But on the other hand, we're not saying the Pope is the Antichrist. That's a ludicrous statement today. Look at uh, some of the uh, positions that Bill and Hillary Clinton are taking today. If you wanted to put the three names in a hat and determine who the Antichrist was, and they were the only three in the hat, you might well opt for Bill or Hillary. I'm not suggesting they're the Antichrist. I'm saying that we ought to be sane in looking at these issues, and that's precisely why you're coming out with a book uh, very shortly and uh, some articles in the Christian Research Journal uh, which put this issue in perspective so that you can reach lost Roman Catholics in the same way we have tried for years to reach lost Protestants. There are all kinds of people in churches who do not know Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord of their life, who are trusting in their own works to get them into heaven and are not trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Walking into a church doesn't make you a car any more than walking into a garage. Excuse me, walking into a garage doesn't make you a car. Walking into a church doesn't make you a Christian. And uh, so we are dealing with an important issue here because we're trying to reach people. This is not an issue which is predicated on money. I am being accused uh, primarily because I've supported uh, Charles Colson and played his uh, speech in which he accepted the Templeton Award, uh, the speech in which he talked about the enduring revolution of the cross. I am being uh, tarred and feathered. I am being castigated as having sold out to Roman Catholicism. Tex Mars says that there is a Jesuit priest on the board of the Christian Research Institute. If he does his homework, he'll find that that is absolutely false, unless Darlene Martin has become a Jesuit <laughs> priest. I don't know uh, that uh, that has happened recently. Uh, it is said that we are being funded by so much money from the Vatican that we simply have to march to their order. And as a matter of fact, uh, people are writing me letters and saying, how is it that you have the courage to speak out against Paul Crouch and not uh, against the Pope? <laughs> well, if the Pope taught what Paul Crouch <laughs> is teaching, <laughs> then you should do it. But the Pope, unfortunately, is teaching historic Orthodox Christianity, and, uh, and he isn't. And uh, you are uh, not endorsing all of, I mean, I feel like I have to keep saying this, you know what I mean? we got to make this qualifier. You are not endorsing. I mean, the, 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 the natural deduction that's made all the time is that having said what you have just said, you are endorsing Roman Catholicism. You can say, no, 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 I am not endorsing all aspects of Roman Catholicism. I have some serious problems with Roman Catholicism. Don't feel badly. I've been called a Jesuit in disguise, uh, too. Uh, and uh, you've got, you're going to take that flank when you uh, let the chips fall where they may. And the chips on this issue um, are that Roman Catholicism is not teaching official heresy. In practice, a lot of what they do contradicts what they say in principle. And in practice, folk Catholicism, we have people who are actually worshiping Mary where Catholics don't believe uh, that you should actually worship Mary. Of course, you're going to have those kinds of inconsistencies. But uh, let Hughes without sin cast the first stone. We've got Protestants who worship other things, including the uh, c country, car, uh, money, and other things that are idolaters, too. And if we, we didn't have any idolaters among us, then we could cast stones at them. All right, we're back, and uh, who wants to cast the first stone? <laughs> little aside there from what, uh, I don't know if I should, uh, there's been a joke going around to call Dr. Norman Geisler Roman Geisler. And uh, I don't know from, uh, of course I'm being a little facetious, I, it's hard for me to control myself, but based on the statements we've heard, it's uh, it seems entirely it, appropriate. Yeah, it, uh, you know, to be called Roman Geisler or a Jesuit in disguise. Um, I don't know. These statements that have been made here that our listeners have just heard are, are pretty hard to take. And I guess we'll just kind of go down the line here, gentlemen, and uh, see what we can come up with. As you know, basically, and uh, of course we invite the listener to rewind the tape at any time if they want to go back and hear some of these statements that are on the tape. So, But uh, Hanegraaff, you know, makes a statement that he's given up the Christian faith, sold out to the Vatican. Of course, these are kind of red herring issues, like the tie in giving up the faith, uh, and then uh, Roman, you know, uh, the being... Uh, you know, uh, someone who receives money from the Vatican and things, those are kind of red herring issues to try to lead into a topic 
he seems to want to bring up when really this particular show that was being done on January the 10th was supposed to be about uh, Geisler's book on Islam. And out of the blue, Hanegraaff decides to uh, do this little spiel on Roman Catholicism, which is very interesting. And, uh, and of course, uh, Geisler... Uh, makes the statement he doesn't know of any other ministry uh, in the world, basically, that's uh, doing, you know, calls it the way they see it. Although I'd like to think uh, our ministry <laughs> would do the same thing. And uh, it seems like we take a lot more flack for what we're doing. That's you know? correct. The position that we've taken is not at all a popular position. Exactly. And uh, I guess the next statement they, they made is that... Uh, uh, Geisler said that uh, CRI holds and he holds the same views as Walter Martin had on Roman Catholicism. Now, I've got a tape clip I'll play after a while, after we play another clip from the next day on the Bible Answer Man. I think it would be apropos at that time. But, uh, Jim, you just happen to have uh, Walter Martin's book. And it's interesting, by the way, that when we had done analysis of CRI on Romanism, uh, part one now, as it turns out, uh, that other tape, uh, we didn't. We made mention of the Walter Martin's book, but we didn't have a copy of it at the time. Now we have a copy of it. That's correct. The the book was mentioned in Martin's tape on Peter the Rock, and he had made mention of the fact that he had written a book back in the 60s that had been published on Roman Catholicism. And the question I had was, where is this book? Why hasn't CRI ever made any mention of it? Uh, they seem to indicate that Walter Martin held the same position that they do, and that that's where they got their position from. But on page 39 of Walter Martin's book under uh, Catholic Tradition in the Bible, Walter Martin says, quote, The Roman Church, in effect, nullifies the good doctrine of the gospel by adding the tradition or commandments of men. Herein lies the deadly parallel to Judaism mentioned by our Lord in Mark 7. And that's right out of Walter Martin's book on Roman Catholicism. I've, I... I, I would suspect that, do you have another quote there? It looks like you have another page with a marking uh, from page 40. Any interesting stuff there? Yes, Martin also said on page 40 that the Roman Catholic Church then is teaching for doctrine the commandments of men and nullifying the commandments of God that they may keep their own traditions. And uh, it's pretty heavy duty stuff. There's a, a lot more in Martin's book that could be said and I think one reason CRI does not offer Walter Martin's book on Roman Catholicism, we had to get it from secondary sources and uh, that's how we've obtained a copy of it, but uh, I think the reason they don't make it available is because it contradicts their position on Roman Catholicism, <laughs> that's right. which uh, we'll find that to be even more so the case when uh, I play a clip of Walter Martin after a while at a place that's more apropos in light of the clip that will be coming up. And I think you'll see very uh, clearly this distinction. Rob, any comments at this point? Well, Larry, I'm just flabbergasted at what I've heard. I'm trying to take it all in and collate it and put it in a reasonable fashion here. I heard uh, one of the gentlemen there, I think it was Mr. Hanegraaff, say that we must look at this issue in a sane manner. And then I hear Dr. Geisler a man who surprises me. I sat under Dr. Geisler at Dallas Theological Seminary when he was a professor there and had some reservations about his understanding of soteriology. And now to hear him sit and speak publicly on this issue of Catholicism just uh, floors me. I don't know where to begin. Perhaps the best way to begin is Dr. Geisler's first statements here insofar as what Catholics believe. He said that they believe the cardinal doctrines or the historic doctrines or orthodox doctrines of the church and he mentioned the virgin birth which is true they do believe in virgin birth deed of christ that is true also but then he mentioned substitutionary atonement and the authority of scripture roman catholics do not believe in substitu substitutionary atonement as uh, a christian would they believe that christ came and opened the door so that god would accept that uh, sacramental system that the roman catholic church has imagined and uh, all uh, who go through the sacramental system have a possibility of being saved, but there's no salvation in Roman Catholic religion. Their idea of salvation is uh, to be deposited in a place called purgatory at the end of their ritualistic stay here on earth. He also mentioned the authority of Scripture. I don't know where Dr. Geisler has been, but for years and years, hundreds of years, the Roman Catholic Church has taught that 
the Bible is in fact infallible and is in fact our source of authority, but they add the apocryphal books to the Bible, and on top of that they bring along tradition of the Roman Catholic religion on a par with the scripture, and on top of that they believe the teaching of the Pope is infallible and the teaching of the magisterium is equal footing with the scripture itself. So it's very misleading for Dr. Geisler to say that Roman Catholics believe in a substitutionary atonement and Roman Catholics believe in the authority of scripture. They simply do not. It's also misleading for Dr. Geisler to say that the Pope is teaching historic Christianity. He most certainly is not teaching historic Christianity. Historic Christianity takes us back to the Council of Trent, and we all know that the Council of Trent formulated the doctrine of justification, which is anathema to Christianity. That You're saying historic Catholic. Historic Catholic doctrine of justification is formulated at the Council of Trent. And the Council of Trent's doctrine on justification is that we are justified not only by faith, but faith plus our works. I have a citation here that I'd like to read for you, Larry, insofar as justification from the Council of Trent. We read this from chapter 15 on the fruits of justification on the sixth session of uh, Council of Trent. Hence, to those who work well unto the end and trust in God, eternal life is to be offered both as a grace mercifully promised to the sons of God through Christ Jesus and as a reward promised by God himself to be faithfully given to their good works and merits. It goes on further to say, we must believe that nothing further is wanting to those justified to prevent them from being considered to have by those very works which have been done in God fully satisfied the divine law according to the state of this life and to have truly merited eternal life. Well, you have the, the uh, Council of Trent saying that God justifies us on the basis of merit, on the basis of good works. In the anathema section of the Council of Trent, it gets worse. Canon number 9 says, If anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, let him be anathema. Canon 11, if anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and the charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Ghost and remains in them, or also that the grace by which we are justified is only the good will of God, let him be anathema. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than the confidence in a divine mercy, let him be anathema. Anathema, anathema, anathema. This is historic Roman Catholic theology. Now to I have no the, idea what guys are talking now about. Now to the un, uninformed, they may not know what anathema means. What does that word mean? It means accursed forever. <laughs> Put in hell. It's the same term that Paul used in Galatians chapter 1 that he reserved for those who would come and preach a different gospel. If anybody preaches a different gospel, let him be accursed, let him be anathema. So this is the historic doctrine on justification of the Roman Catholic religion. This is what the Pope is teaching. This is what the Pope is sworn to. It cannot be changed. In fact, uh, just to, uh, to jump in here, the Pope today is teaching, as Popes have in the past, that uh, that the God of the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians are all, they're all worshiping the same God. Oh, yeah, absolutely he, and, right. And the Pope is tying into all this modern liberal Roman Catholic theology that you find in the New Jerome Biblical Commentary, where they say uh, books in the Bible are myth and legend. The vicarious atonement of Christ on the cross is not important. In fact, as a reference to any listeners here, I urge you to get our tape, an Analysis of C.R.I. on Romanism, Part 1. Because in there we give you direct references out of the Roman Catholic catechisms and uh, the New Jerome Biblical Commentary to substantiate all this. Like Jonah and the well was a myth that never happened. Right. Uh, the atonement of Christ, unnecessary. Uh, just absolutely startling stuff. And the Pope is going along with all of this. It's overwhelming to me. On the one hand, we have historic Roman Catholicism. And uh, both Mr. Hanegraaff and, and Dr. Geisler said that the Roman Catholic religion teaches salvation by grace. Well, what Dr. Geisler should tell you and what Mr. Hanegraaff should know is that the definition of grace in the Roman Catholic religion is absolutely contrary to our understanding of grace. When a Roman Catholic says he's saved by grace, 
he means that God infuses grace into him so that he can work good works, and those good works, as I've already read, are merit for his justification. It's a foreign concept to the Bible's understanding of grace. In fact, any listener can get any Roman Catholic catechism or encyclopedia and look it up for themselves, and they will find under the definition of grace exactly and it may be a few different words, but basically what Rob has just said. In, in a it, nutshell. Right. That the infused, uh, almost like a substance poured into the soul that enables the person to work the good works of faith. Now, it, it, it is so uh, <laughs> difficult to respond to this because one gets heated. I want to try to calm down here a little bit. But on the issue of, uh, of modern Rome... It, it, it's, it's bad enough that Roman Catholicism has attached itself to the doctrines of Trent and cannot deny them and affirm them both in Vatican I and Vatican II, and the doctrine of Trent alone destroy biblical Christianity. But now modern Rome comes along, and I'd like to read this section on uh, Nostra Aetate out of Vatican uh, II, October 28, 1965, where we read from Vatican II, the Church has also a high regard for the Muslims. They worship God, who is one living and subsistent, merciful and almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, who has also spoken to men. They strive to submit themselves without reserve to the hidden decrees of God, just as Abraham submitted himself to God's plan, to whose faith Muslims eagerly link their own. Although not acknowledging him as God, they venerate Jesus as a prophet. His virgin mother they also honor, and even at times devoutly invoke. Further, they await the day of judgment and the reward of God following the resurrection of the dead. For this reason, they highly esteem an upright life and worship God, especially by way of prayer, alms, deeds, and fasting. If you want to say that teaching that Muslims worship God because they have a high regard for Jesus as a prophet and they sometimes inculcate Mary, that that is historic Christianity, then we don't know historic Christianity. In fact, in, Islam, in Islamic religion, they deny that Jesus is the Son of God. They say, uh, let no man say that God has a Son. And they deny He was crucified on a cross, thereby denying the atonement of Christ on the cross for sins. And they thought that Mary was part of the Trinity. Yes, it says that right in the Quran, and I find this totally ironic in the sense that this Bible Answer Man show with Hannah Graff and Geisler is supposed to be on Islam, and uh, they end up in this uh, almost uh, rose garden type cherry attitude towards uh, Roman Catholic theology. It's uh, almost beyond belief. Yeah, one other thing, Larry, and then I'll, I'll quiet down here a little bit. Uh, uh, one of the gentlemen made the statement that it was a matter of semantics and that there were uh, some minor differences that uh, did not separate us from the religion of Rome. And, and one of those minor differences in which uh, was said correctly we disagree is the doctrine of purgatory. Now, how anyone with a straight face and with any kind of theological integrity can say that purgatory is a minor difference is beyond me. The Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory says, in effect, that every person who does not have enough good works, enough merit, or has not been able to borrow some from saints who've gone by, must land in purgatory to pay God to suffer and pay God for his uh, personal sins, sins uh, done while he is on earth. Now, this doctrine of purgatory was formulated in the early Roman Catholic religion, and it was set in concrete in Trent, December 1563, 25th session, the decree concerning purgatory. This decree concerning purgatory has not been done away with by the Roman Catholic religion. Vatican II affirms the Council of Trent as being binding on all Roman Catholics. And the whole doctrine of purgatory runs flat counter to the atonement of Christ, the forgiveness of sins in Christ, the washing away of our sins, decrees, and certificates of debt against us, Colossians chapter 2. Dr. Geisler, you know this. Hank Hanegraaff, we're surprised you don't. <laughs> and uh, what I find fascinating about this whole doctrine of purgatory, it is a 
different gospel as as Rob is going berserk over here. Uh, it is a different gospel because it supplants the all-encompassing, all-sufficing death of Christ on the cross. And it makes sinners responsible for purging their own sins when That's Christ correct. has already paid that sin debt in his own body on the cross. So God uh, isn't an Indian giver. <laughs> this is true. He gave us salvation and he gave it to us eternally. Uh, there's absolutely nothing that we can do ourselves. Something else I would like to mention is they also brought up the point that uh, the Roman Catholic Church affirms the virgin birth. But wouldn't both of y'all say that they affirm it, yes, but they distort it. And they distort it beyond belief. They add to the virgin birth the assumption of Mary, that Mary was a perpetual virgin. And Rob, you would like to make some statements on that. Well, I started uh, out by saying that the two gentlemen on the tape, uh, Mr. Hanegraaff and Dr. Geisler, have said that they do not agree with the elevation of Mary in the Roman Catholic religion and that it, it is a, a problem, but they have also stated that it's a minor thing that we certainly can get over or it's not enough to keep us uh, from saying that the Roman Catholic religion is a different gospel. I'd like to read to you from the New Catholic Encyclopedia on Mary the Blessed Virgin. This citation, I think, hits the point better than I could explain. The citation uh, states on page 349, Certainly she advanced in grace with the attainment of the use of reason whenever, prematurely or normally, in God's arrangements that occurred, and she especially advanced in grace at the time of the Incarnation. From that moment on, an ineffable relationship existed between the incarnate Word and His Mother. And whereas Mary gave Christ His humanity, our Lord gave His Mother a constantly increasing participation in His divinity. Besides Mary's unique degree of habitual grace as a permanent mode of being, she surpassed all other creatures, too, in the reception of actual graces. God granted her all the graces of intellect and will necessary to perform each action in her life with the greatest possible perfection. The teaching is that Mary has been granted a part of the divinity of her son by virtue of God granting her graces. This is absolutely heretical. The article goes on to say that in Catholic theology, the title Mediatrix is applied to Our Lady for three reasons. First, because owing to her divine motherhood and plenitude of grace, she occupies a middle position in the hierarchy of beings between the Creator and His creatures. This is known technically as her ontological mediation. Second, because during her earthly career she contributed considerably through acts of holiness to the reconciliation between God and man brought about by the Savior. She's a part of the Saviorhood. Without her, Jesus couldn't have saved anybody. Third, because through her powerful intercession in heaven she obtains for her spiritual children all the graces that God deigns to bestow on them. All graces go through Mary. She obtained them on earth, she obtains them in heaven, and she's the uh, mediatrix along with Jesus Christ. This is absolute heresy. It's not a minor difference. What is this, what is this article you're reading? I'm reading from the New Catholic Encyclopedia under the uh, heading Mary, Blessed Virgin 2, page 359. And uh, totally amazing. And I would like to mention Walter Martin again. He wrote an article called The Cult of Mary. And in here he has a, uh, a, uh, a chapter, you might say, called Seven Steps to Deity, talking about the Roman Catholic doctrine of Mary. He's, first of all, Mary is called the Mother of God. Then uh, she's elevated to the Immaculate Conception, declared in 1854, with, to be born without sin. Then Perpetual Virginity. And then uh, Co-Redemptrix and Mediatrix of All Graces. Then Walter goes on to mention how they've given her an assumption into heaven, and then finally given the title of Queen of Heaven. Now I know there's a uh, uh, that that phrase Queen of Heaven is found in the Bible, but I don't think it's talking about a literal Queen of Heaven. I think it's talking more about a, a idolatrous pagan god that uh, that that uh, deceived people were following. 
And so here you have Walter writing against it, but uh, apparently to Hanegraaff and uh, Geisler, Roman Geisler, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I guess it's just a minor issue you know, on this subject. Jim, any other comments on yeah, that? Yeah, I would uh, like to ask Rob a question and have him respond to it. I would have to say that almost every Roman Catholic that I've ever met would affirm that Mary is the mother of God. Now, what would you say about Mary being the mother of God? Well, of course, uh, if Mary gave birth to God, then Mary is God. And we have two gods now, God Mary and uh, the God in heaven, who uh, presumably is seated on the throne next to Mary. Thus, we have a female God and her son, a male God. So it's absolute heresy to say that Mary is the mother of the God who is in heaven. They use that statement to define uh, Mary's relationship to Jesus Christ. And I would just point out that the scriptures nowhere paint her as being the uh, mother of deity. She gave to Christ his human nature, and in her womb, according to the scriptures, this Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, hovered over her, and the uh, author of Christ's uh, deity, insofar as the incarnation is concerned, the hypostatic union, was not Mary. It was the Spirit of God. Couldn't have happened apart from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the agent of the incarnation. Mary is the vehicle that brought it along. I'll tell you what. Well, we've been hearing a lot of stuff here, and uh, uh, there's still more we could say on what they were saying in that clip a, a little bit ago. And one of them, one of them was this art argument they made here. Uh, uh, Hanegraaff said, we have more in common with Orthodox Catholics than with liberal Protestants. You know, uh, so apparently uh, it's all right to have more in common with, uh, you know, Catholics, Orthodox Catholics, than with liberal Protestants. I would say uh, we don't have anything in common with either one. Yeah, that's, that's uh, bringing in a straw man and blowing them away. I mean, uh, the idea that, that uh, uh, we have more in common with a, a Roman Catholic uh, rather than a liberal is jumping right out of the frying pan into the fire and uh, bringing in a straw man. I mean, anybody can make that kind of statement, you know, that uh, if I'm in a foxhole with uh, somebody who is a, a murderer, a rapist, a, a child abuser, uh, somebody who is a heinous to society, has run away from prison, we happen to find ourselves in the same foxhole, and we are being bombed by the enemy, I could turn and say, oh, I have more in common with this rapist, this uh, child molester, this killer, <laughs> than I do about the people who are trying to bomb me. Isn't that a great <laughs> statement to make? <laughs> great analogy. Uh, also, uh, Geisler said, quote, it is an absolute shame that we should be attacking these people. Some of whom are born-again believers. Uh, and then he says, Roman Catholics are fundamentalists, believing in, quote, all the fundamentals. Why should we be attacking them instead of liberals, end quote? Uh, how do you gentlemen respond to uh, Geisler's statement there? I think Dr. Geisler is either ignorant of the fundamentals of the faith or he is ignorant of Roman Catholicism. It's hard for me to believe that he is ignorant of either, so uh, doubtless his strategy is unknown to man. But Roman Catholics have nothing in common with the fundamentalist gospel. They do have a lot in common insofar as the superficial things that they are taught in their confessions. I believe in one God, the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, born of the Virgin Mary, suffering and upon. That sort of rote memory of the confession is what he may be relying upon, but I assure you the gospel of the Roman Catholic religion is sacramentalism, it is works salvation, it is not even technically salvation because every Roman Catholic ends up in purgatory except for the super saints, and uh, therefore it has nothing to do with the fundamentalist gospel. So, Well, well Hanegraaff mentioned uh, that they're sticking to official Roman Catholic teachings, so maybe you're just going on some Joe Blow Catholic that works at the gas station, or uh, are you talking about official Roman Catholic doctrine also? Well, I read from the Council of Trent on, tw on two occasions tonight, and I also read from the New Catholic Encyclopedia. Now, I grant you that the Council of Trent is more powerful than the New Catholic Encyclopedia, but uh, had we had the time, uh, we would go through Denzinger, the doctrines of the Roman Catholic religion, the councils, the decrees of the popes, the uh, uh, magisterium, uh, all, all that pertains to Roman Catholic dogma and doctrine, and we would see that in its official teaching it is contrary to 
every evangelical understanding of salvation and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Jim, do you uh, do you notice what I notice here that when uh, Hanegraaff and Geisler are talking about Roman Catholicism, and they're basically saying people that attack it don't understand it, and this for it, and they're sticking with Ro official teachings. But do we actually hear them quoting Roman Catholic doctrine, teachings, theologians, uh, or do we just hear? vague statements uh, coming out of these gentlemen. It's all vague statements and I would like to go back and for a moment address uh, the statement that uh, Hanegraaff made about being sane and not driving them off and would like to refer the listeners back to the the first tape that we did on an analysis of CRI on Romanism where we go into in depth on this particular statement and ask the question, well then what about the reformers? Were they driving everybody off? Were they sane? You're talking about Luther, Calvin, and in fact, uh, Rob, you have uh, a lot of background in church history, particularly on the Protestant Reformation. Did uh, Luther and Calvin, uh, Zwingli, Knox, uh, uh, the early confessions of the church, like the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, or the Westminster Confession, or all these other Protestant confessions, uh, they would have the same view as Hank Hanegraaff and, and, and Geisler here. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that? Uh, neither, neither Mr. Hanegraaff nor Dr. Geisler would uh, have uh, been able to speak in any Reformation church, be it Baptist, Lutheran, be it uh, Calvinist assembly. None of them would be allowed to speak. They would be considered papist, and they would be overruled and set out and put outside of the church. What people do not understand is that the entire history of the Reformation is centered around the doctrine of justification, doctrine of salvation, and everything written by the great reformers, Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, uh, Theodore Weiss, uh, Philip Melanchthon, uh, uh, John Calvin, uh, John Knox, uh, uh, earlier before that, Johann Huss and, and uh, John Wycliffe, were written contrary to the Roman Catholic doctrines that we are speaking of right now. So for these men to call themselves uh, Christian apologists and to anoint the Roman Catholic religion is almost beyond belief. They would not historically be allowed to speak in any of the Bible-believing churches and, uh, and Re Reformation uh, churches that were uh, uh, coming out of the Roman Catholic religion. Now, you know, this was the, when I first heard this tape, I was almost knocked to the floor because I don't think I've ever, ever heard uh, anyone refer to uh, Roman Catholicism or Roman Catholics as being fundamentalists. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Carl Keating might have a tr have trouble with that yeah, one. Th this is outrageous. <laughs> this is absolutely outrageous. And, and uh, uh, Dr. Geisler has mentioned he's written or, or has written an upcoming book on Roman Catholicism. I'll put a plug in right now. I have just finished a book entitled Romanism, The Relentless Roman Catholic Assault on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, I encourage all of you to order it through this ministry and read for yourself. It's written in plain language, and it's well documented. You know, Dr. Geisler has made the statement that we really don't understand Rome. Let's find out. Grab my book, read it, take a look at the footnotes, the bibliography, see if I am not quoting the highest possible Catholic sources to validate their religion. In fact, I'd like to, as long as we're putting in a plug here, I'd also like to mention that Rob Zins and myself have done a 16-part video series, which is also available on audio cassette, on Roman Catholicism, from the Mass to the Doctrine of Mary to the Pope to Roman Catholic inventions to just any number of things, Roman Catholic apologists, you name it. Uh, we've, we've done something on it. Kind of even reminds me of that video we did on Mary, and uh, we showed a picture of one of the Roman Catholic catechisms where they actually had a picture of the Virgin Mary in with the Trinity. <laughs> as part of the, the you know the members of the Trinity, it was a, an, an amazing thing, and we, we we showed it right on right on television. I'd uh, also like to get my plug in here. In the appendix of Rob's book, he has a has done a fantastic job on refuting Carl Keating's uh, position on Lorraine Bettner in his book of Roman Catholicism, and I think that that's something that needed to be done for a long time. Uh, the Roman Catholics always try to de debunk Bettner, and I think that Rob has done in a, a very clear and easily understandable fashion a great job of refuting Keating on this. Yes. Okay, with uh, one more thing to say here, I'd like to have you guys address uh, what Hanegraaff was saying about uh, Roman Catholics have a confused soteriology. 
as if uh, confused soteriology is acceptable. And, uh, you know, Geisler then says the difference in soteriology is like ships passing in the night. Nuances of the Roman Catholic view of soteriology are not understood by, the, to, by those opposed to their view. Roman Catholics believe in salvation by grace. Roman Catholic faith is the kind of faith that produces good works, and so do we believe that. There is not that much difference. End quote from Geisler. Any last statements there? Well, I would say that two ships passing in the night can sometimes collide. And I believe that that's what's happened with uh, the Roman Catholic doctrine on soteriology and uh, the position that we would hold as evangelical Christians. Mm -hmm. Rob looks like he's totally speechless over here. <laughs> well, I, I once heard an illustration about a, a, a evil Knievel, the uh, former motorcyclist uh, daredevil type guy who was always jumping over things. and. Uh, I believe he was attempting to uh, jump over his uh, greatest effort. You know, he cranked up his motorcycle, and right before he took off, he said, Now, you realize it doesn't uh, matter if I miss by one inch or uh, or a hundred yards in this thing. Either way, I'm going to crash. And uh, that's the way it is with the Roman Catholic religion. They can be pretty right in some areas, but they are so wrong in the areas they are wrong in that it disqualifies them as representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul was willing to admit in the scriptures that the first century Pharisees had a zeal for God and they had um, a lot of orthodoxy in their understanding of monotheism and the God of Israel, Yahweh, so forth and so on. But Paul says they did not have an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ, and therefore they were anathema. He witnessed to them, he preached to them, he went into their synagogues, and he told them, you are so right in so many areas, I commend you, but the one thing you miss is the gospel. Same thing with the Catholics, whether they miss it by two inches or 200 yards, it's a big miss, and they crash and they burn. When the Roman Catholic religion denies Trent, and comes forth with justification by faith alone in the righteousness of Christ, when, when they deny purgatory, when they deny baptismal regeneration, when they deny the sacramental system of penance, when they realize that the Mass is not an unbloody sacrifice whereby they receive grace for further meritorious works, in other words, when they deny their whole system, then we can begin to talk together. Yes. All right, with that said... As if you haven't heard enough, <laughs> I know Rob's going to love this one because, as a matter of fact, and this is a truthful statement, Rob, you have never heard these clips until just now when we decided to do this tape. Uh, th brand new. That's why I'm stuttering so much. I find it difficult to hear, but I'm getting used to it, so <laughs> let's go. <laughs> All right. We're going to go now to the next day on the Bible Answer Man show. That would be January the 11th, 1994 where Norman Geisler is once again a guest with Hank Hanegraaff as they're plugging his Islam book. But uh, somehow they get into talking about Roman Catholicism once again. So let's go to that clip, and we'll be back after the clip. It's a good thing to remember that when you're dealing with them, uh, for God so loved the world, uh, John 3.16, in the uh, Arabic Bible, when you're dealing uh, with uh, Muslims, is uh, Allah so loved uh, the world. Uh, we use the term because it is a term that refers ultimately to God, even though they misunderstand uh, God, and it is the term in the culture, and it does refer to a transcendent, infinite creator of the universe, which is not an idol. Okay, that's very helpful. I, I appreciate that. Uh, Hank, also, if it's okay to, is it okay to ask another question uh, about your comments yesterday on Dr. Walter Martin's view on Roman Catholicism? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, um, another prominent uh, gentleman on the radio uh, we get in this area, uh, Dr. Robert Morey, he had been uh, making statements recently that uh, he took Walter Martin's view on Roman Catholicism, that it was uh, non-Christian, and, uh, you know, making accusations that CRI is now the new CRI. So I knew from an old Bible Answer Man program that I had recorded back in 1988 uh, that Walter Martin stated emphatically that it, the Catholic Church was a Christian church, and uh, I called up his program to challenge uh, him to play this uh, excerpt on the air. I can understand why he declined because of technical problems and things, but, uh, you know, can you comment on that as far as... Uh, he, he mentioned that Dr. Martin said it was apostate, but he declined from using the term cult. 
So what would be the difference between cult and apostate? Well, first of all, uh, a cult doctrinally uh, denies one or more of the major doctrines of Christianity. Roman Catholicism does not deny the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement, or the bodily resurrection, and so they are not a cult. They have no formal uh, heresy. But in practice, uh, Roman Catholicism, folk Catholicism, for example, is involved uh, in the worship of Mary, which in practice can't be distinguished uh, from what their theologians make the fine distinctions, uh, hyperdulia and dulia and latria and these type of things. So what we say is that formally and officially, uh, it is not uh, a cult. Actually, there are many cultic aspects, there are many cultic practices, but so are there in Protestants, so are there in other uh, groups. So they're not to be condemned any more than we are for those kinds of uh, things. And Dr. Martin was a pioneer in this area of opening up this kind of dialogue and emphasizing the important orthodox dimensions of Roman Catholicism that we share in common and ought to use as a basis uh, for moving ahead in our society and attacking the real enemy, which is out there, the people denying these doctrines, not those who are affirming them. And I do not want to get into a uh, conversation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the specifics of the questions you asked, except to say that it is wrong in general to say that there's an old CRI and a new CRI. Uh, this uh, organization has not uh, become different in any way whatsoever, and anybody that's observed it for a long period of time or listened to me on the air uh, knows that while I may have some tangential differences with Dr. Walter Martin, they were in peripheral issues. Uh, they were never in uh, any issues that had to do with orthodoxy whatsoever, and I think that you can affirm that. Dr. Geisler, you followed uh, Dr. Martin's ministry, and you followed my ministry here over the last uh, five or six years. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wish everyone could have been with us last night. We attended a Roman Catholic Bible study at a Roman Catholic church where the man taught verse by verse through the Bible. He's doing it over a five-year period. I defy anyone to find a better Bible study, a better Bible teaching than that one uh, last night. There are many wonderful born-again uh, Catholics who are studying the Bible, and I think we ought to affirm uh, this truth that we have in common with them. And I think the real issue here, Ken, from my perspective, is that uh, I can guarantee everyone that's listening to me right now that I'm going to do what's right, uh, regardless of where the chips fall. In other words, uh, when I deal with issues, whether it's Roman Catholicism or Islam or the Word Faith Teachers or uh, the new book, The Message, uh, published by NAV Press, I'm not trying to win a popularity contest. What I'm trying to do is speak the truth in love. Subject myself, but I've spent time with men like Walter Martin and Norman Geisler and so many others, and this is the conclusion that they come to as well, based not on their just random opinions, but based on what Scripture says. Yes, and I want to commend uh, a CRI for taking this uh, continuous and consistent stand. Dr. Walter Martin was absolutely right on this issue, and uh, Hank Hanegraaff has carried through that consistently, and CRI has stood there, and you're going to get shot from both sides. We get shot from both sides. I'm called a, a secret uh, Jesuit, you know, and uh, on the Vatican payroll and stuff. Uh, truth is truth, and uh, I'd rather uh, take attack for the truth than to compromise for error. There are two fears in life. The fear of man brings a snare, and the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom, and you have to decide which fear is going to motivate you most. Ken, uh, you mentioned uh, the problems of being able to demonstrate that Walter Martin believed that Catholicism was orthodox at its core. Uh, I can help you with that very easily. Let me let everybody listen to this. It is not the core of Catholicism which disturbs us, because they confess the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the perfection of our Lord, his miracles, his vicarious death on the cross, his bodily resurrection, salvation through him alone, the resurrection from the dead, ascension into heaven, our great high priest before the Father, after the order of Melchizedek. They believe also in the second coming of Jesus Christ, the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, and they loudly maintain that they have always believed in justification by faith, as notes in the current Catholic Bibles indicate. So they believe in this, as well as in eternal judgment, and in bliss for the redeemed in heaven. Now, that basic outline of Christian theology is not the core of Catholicism which disturbs. Now, if you get a problem with that statement, uh, that's one thing. But you can't say that Walter Martin said something different. You were just listening to him, and this is one of the problems that I've run into over and over again, suddenly because Walter Martin is no longer here to defend himself, people are putting words in his mouth. Speaking of putting words 
in Walter's mouth. I think we'll do that right now. We're going to play a clip from the very same tape that Hanegraaff just played of Walter Martin and uh, play for you a part of the tape by Walter that uh, Hank Hanegraaff uh, apparently forgot was on the tape or didn't care to play for the listening audience. But we're going to play it for you right now, uh, straight from Walter Martin. Then we'll make our comments on this statement and all the other statements uh, that you've just heard. As Christians, what ought our attitude to be? It ought to be an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of joy, because God has delivered us from this system into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. We are not the descendants of this papacy, nor do we wish to be. We do not wish its sacraments, we do not wish its dogmas. We worship only Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, Redeemer and Savior of lost men. We reject a corrupt church, a backslidden church, an apostate church, and reach out to her people with the love of Christ, holding forth Holy Scripture, as Strossmeyer said and standing upon the liberty wherein Christ has set us free. Let us not think that Rome has changed her basic positions. She has not. Her catechisms are essentially the same. Her dogmas, uncompromising. It is the same Roman Catholic Church as at the Council of Trent, only carefully adapted to American Protestant culture. It is a Roman Catholic Church which today threatens Protestantism in various parts of the world whenever she gains the upper hand. Well, folks, you heard it yourself. We put words in Walter's mouth. The only problem was the words were coming out of his mouth and from the very same tape that Hank Hanegraaff had just played a while ago. Uh, I don't know what you would call this where you play part of a tape and leave out another part of the tape. But uh, the fact is clear. Walter said that the Roman Catholic Church was apostate, backslidden, corrupt, or whatever else, and uh, said it's threatening Protestantism wherever it gains the upper hand. Uh, I think these are very clear-cut statements and seem to be in stark contrast to what we're hearing from Hanegraaff, who apparently is heading up the new CRI as opposed to the old CRI. <laughs> I don't know, but... Uh, Gentlemen, uh, uh, just before we get into the main body of what was said, and we'll go over that in detail, uh, what comments would you like to make about uh, Walter's statement in contrast to what we've been hearing so far from uh, Hannah Graff and uh, uh, Mr. Geisler? Well, I think, Larry, that it's apparent to me that uh, the expression of uh, Hank Hannah Graff that uh, he is following Dr. Martin simply is not true. That Dr. Martin recognized the Roman Catholic religion for what it was, an apostate organization, even though he affirmed some of the orthodox doctrines that uh, Christians believe everywhere, he also mentioned that Rome has simply not changed. That they still hold to the Council of Trent, that their doctrines from the Council of Trent were still antithetical to biblical Christianity, and he thanked God that we were not part of them and that we had to work, we had to uh, lovingly witness back to them and take the gospel into the Roman Catholic religion. Now this is altogether different from what Dr. Geisler and Hank Hanegraaff had said about Walter Martin. They in fact said that, that Dr. Martin did not believe this uh, uh, about the Roman Catholic religion and uh, from that last clip it becomes apparent to me anyway that uh, they are uh, misleading uh, in their use of uh, Dr. Martin's citations, and this reminds me of uh, Paul Harvey's We Have Word the Rest of the Story. Well, thank you, Rob, for that. Uh, I would like to state that the question the caller originally asked was, what's the difference between cult and apostate? And I think if the listener will go back and roll the tape back and listen again, they'll find out that Hanegraaff and Geisler never answered that question. They started to discuss what a cult was, but they never even touched the idea of apostate. 
let alone answer the question. And of course, you know, Geisler said, well, Roman Catholicism is not a cult. And he said that uh, Roman Catholicism cannot be condemned any more than Protestantism can be condemned. And, uh, well, basically, uh, I think that's enough right there that, that deserves to be discussed. Uh, any comments on, on this particular subject of what is the difference between a cult and an apostate church? Rob, would you have anything? Or Jim? Go ahead, Rob. Well, I think uh, the word cult is misleading and also a, a, a poor word to use in regards to these matters because a cult is only as good as your definition of a cult. And if you narrowly define what a cult is, then naturally you're going to exclude some things which perhaps other people would put into the category of cult. If you broaden your definition, you'll be accused of uh, being too inclusive. So the word cult is only as good as the person holding the pencil and defining the term. So you're saying the word cult is like a, a vague term that anybody can feed a definition into and make the word cult mean anything they want. That's precisely true. Some time ago, uh, CRI ran an article in their uh, magazine on uh, the cults and had included Roman Catholicism in the, in the discussion as to whether it was a, a cult, and they concluded it wasn't. But if you look at their grid and the definition of what is a cult, they so narrowly defined the word cult that they couldn't possibly put Roman Catholicism in there. Had they just broadened it a little bit, Roman Catholicism would have fit every single category. So I don't like to use that word cult at all. As far as apostasy is concerned, that's closer to a biblical term. It's the idea of turning away, turning your back, running off, and leaving the uh, Christian faith far behind. It's the idea of that they were with us, but they were not of us. Had they been of us, they would not have gone out from us. The whole idea of uh, an apostate church are those who have come in contact with the gospel, but for any number of reasons have simply turned their back on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, of course, Rome has had contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ historically, uh, Rome comes out of the same gospel that we're reading and over the years they have compounded their foolishness with their own man-made doctrines which have uh, run them right out of the circle of Christianity. Well, I'm an Englishman as you've heard and I realize I'm one and I realize too that I'm in America and you may find um, in my talk tonight that there will be uh, terminology um, and aspects of uh, the, our faith and the state of our church in England, which I'm going to speak about, which uh, you may not uh, be familiar with. The apostasy that we have witnessed in the last century, the compromise on the essentials of our faith and the attack on its fundamentals, actually have their roots in the 19th century. That century, provided Great Britain with unprecedented prosperity, political power, and global influence, as well as what we call in our politics the feel-good factor. At the same time, prominent committed Christians, such as Livingstone, Wilberforce, and Shaftesbury, Lord Shaftesbury, brought the gospel to the lost and social reform to the deprived and the excluded. Victorian values to which we look back with such nostalgia today, and you may do too, uh, were derived from the scriptures and brought many blessings and earned us much respect abroad. On the face of it, all seemed to be well with the church too, but appearances were deceiving. Malign spiritual forces were at large principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, conspiring to undermine the very foundations of our faith. During the course of that benign and well-intentioned century, the 19th century, the Protestant Reformed religion established by law, which our Her Majesty the Queen is sworn to, which for centuries had stood firm yielded ground to its sworn enemy and came under sustained attack on several fronts. 
The Catholic Emancipation Act was uh, enacted in 1829, and the Jesuit order were, was allowed to return to England. Within just four years, the Romanizing movement within the Church of England had been launched at Oxford, known as the Oxford Movement. And as we shall see, Anglo-Catholicism, that is the ritualism planted within the Anglican Church, was set to play a crucial role in the attack on the foundations of the Reform faith and in the strategy of the Counter-Reformation. That strategy was laid out unmistakably by Cardinal Manning, who was the head of the Roman Catholic Church in England at that time, speaking to a gathering of Jesuit leaders in 1870, that very year when papal infallibility was instituted in Rome. Great is the prize for which you strive, he said. Surely a soldier's eye and a soldier's heart would choose by intuition this field of England. None ampler or nobler could be found. It is a head of Protestantism, the center of its movement, movements, and the stronghold of its power. Weakened in England, it is paralyzed everywhere. Conquered in England, it is conquered throughout the world. Once overthrown here, all else is a war of detail. All the roads of the world meet in one point, and this point reached, all the world is open to the church's will, referring to the Holy Mother Church. Just as at the time of the Reformation, the word of God itself came under sustained attack. The futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy, propagated unsuccessfully by the Jesuits at the time of the Reformation, had been repackaged and disseminated into the church through the flood of tracts of the newly formed Brethren movement and the Anglo-Catholic Tractarians, headed, of course, by Cardinal John Henry Newman. This new understanding of Daniel, chapter 7, 2 Thessalonians 2, and Revelation, laid the foundation of a false theology of Antichrist, the spurious scriptural basis for the modern ecumenical movement. A new Bible was required and was duly produced by Anglo-Catholic scholars, Professors Westcott and Hort at Cambridge. Their revised version of the Bible, which became your revised version of the Bible over here, its translation of the prophetic passages relating to Antichrist lent itself to the new futurist theology. Protestant author and former secretary of the Protestant Truth Society in London, Albert Close, wrote in 1916, I quote, the Jesuits have enticed our theological professors and the Plymouth Brethren to fire high over the head of the great Antichrist, one in the past, the Praetorist, the other in the future, the futurist Antichrist. Between these two schools, the whole Christian ministry has been mixed up and is practically sitting on the fence. Few ministers nowadays preach Daniel or Revelation on the Antichrist. Of course, that remains the case today. Given the impact in the theological colleges and the wider church of the new higher criticism in the climate of Darwinism and advancing humanism, it's not surprising that the new understanding of Bible prophecy in the middle of the 19th century spread as quickly as it did. And then later on, the Schofield Reference Bible appeared in the 1920s 
and was greatly influential, especially among Pentecostals. Full of scholarly footnotes, it incorporated futurist theology into its dispensationalist scheme in such a way that few were able to distinguish it from the inspired scriptures. Dispensational futurism has subsequently spread widely in evangelical circles, especially among charismatics, and is now accepted by the majority of Christians as the new orthodoxy. This has seriously weakened the spiritual armory of the church. With the Antichrist yet to appear and the papacy vindicated from its accusers, the authority of scripture was enhanced among those who sought reconciliation with Rome. The Counter-Reformation, so hostile and confrontational towards heretics, as they called them in the past, had emerged with a new face and a new strategy and an ecumenical Bible. In 1910, at the Edinburgh World Missionary Conference, the modern ecumenical movement was born. Antichrist was no longer the Roman papacy, except to a diminishing remnant, but a political world ruler who would appear at the end of the age. A few generations would pass and Christians raised on or drawn to the new Bible versions and the new eschatology would be ready to abandon and even repent of the Reformation separated position regarding Rome. This, by the way, is still the constitutional position uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, to which the Queen is sworn to by her coronation oath. The new climate in which tolerance and unity is preferred to truth ensured that this was going to happen. The ancient landmark of scripture could be removed within the Church of England. It was at a place called Keel in the middle of England in a county called Derbyshire in 1967. The first national evangelical Anglican conference called NIAC met at Keel in April 1967 with 1,000 clergy and laity taking part. It has been described as having marked a turning point in Anglican evangelicalism in the 20th century. And now, 34 years after Keel, the majority of evangelicals who are still in the Church of England look back with considerable satisfaction at what they see as the great achievements of the Keel Conference. They believe it was at Keel that at last the unity which they'd longed for and prayed for became a reality. Those who were regarded as conservative evangelicals repented of their withdrawal and their sectarian attitudes and began to engage with the wider church and the world. The conference had been primed to deal with the new policy of Anglican evangelicals towards ecumenism. The ecumenical movement had gained wide acceptance within the Church of England and beyond, and careful preparations had been made for the Keel Conference to successfully launch the new evangelicalism, which was to unite evangelicals with their Anglo-Catholic and liberal brethren. Dr. Michael Ramsey, the Anglo-Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury at that time, was there to open the conference. It was highly significant that he was the conference's choice. It set the tone for what was to follow. Ramsey was sympathetic towards reunion with Rome. He had officially visited the Pope in the Vatican in 1966, and he described the whole ecumenical enterprise as, quote, the Holy Spirit working in us, uniting us in love, and building us up in truth. He looked upon evangelicalism as sectarian and even heretical, and he took the opportunity afforded him by the conference to lecture a passive audience on their need to draw closer to Anglo-Catholicism. 
or ritualism. Let us recognize, he said, that amongst us Anglicans, some may have experienced the centrality of the cross in ways different from others. For instance, those who value, as others do not, such things as sacramental confession or the Eucharistic sacrifice. Bishop J.C. Ryle's warnings in the 19th century about the dangers presented by Anglo-Catholicism still echo down to us from that century. The Anglo-Catholics, formerly known as the Tractarians, had long had a well-concealed plan for church and nation to be reunited with the Church of Rome. Societies within their movement, all of them secret, included the Society of the Holy Cross, the Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament, and most particularly, the order of corporate reunion. Much of their business, as I've said, always done in secret. And at the end of the 19th century, an article on the newest fashions of ritualism appeared in a Jesuit publication called The Month. It declared that, quote, at any rate, the ritualists are doing a good work, which in the present state of the country, Catholics cannot do in the same proportion. They, the ritualists, or Anglo-Catholics, are preparing the soil and sowing the seed for a rich harvest, which the Catholic Church will reap sooner or later. And that recalls Cardinal Manning's words to the Jesuits earlier, earlier on. Cardinal John Henry Newman, hero and saint to most Anglo-Catholics and most influential leader of the Oxford movement, was said by religious correspondent of the T London Times, Clifford Longley, to have written the agenda of the Second Vatican Council from the grave. Newman's contribution to the cause of reunion with Rome is highly valued by the Vatican, and he seems sure to emerge as the first ecumenical saint of the Roman Church. His defection to Rome in 1845 was described at the time by a future Prime Minister, William Gladstone, as possibly the greatest religious crisis since the Reformation. How far things have moved since then. Through the Anglo-Catholic movement, Newman's reformulation of doctrine, which is synonymous with continuing revelation, has had enormous influence inside and outside the Church of England. It has greatly influenced many charismatics and liberals and evangelicals today, and provided good food for ecumenical believers too. Newman's essay, called The Development of Christian Doctrine, which he began as an Anglican and, uh, and apparently as a Protestant and finished as a Roman Catholic, was the proof text for those who helped put together the agreed statements of Archic, Archic being the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission. As such, it has helped to bring about the original goal of the Tractarians or the Anglo-Catholics, of convergence with Rome. The final Archic report, approved by the General Synod of the Church of England in 1986, and by the Lambeth, Lambeth Conference of Bishops worldwide, which of course includes the Episcopalian Church of the USA in 1988, and the report's 1994 clarifications, show Anglican doctrine and practice on ministry and the Lord's Supper to be reformulated in line with the Council of Trent. When Newman had met Cardinal Wiseman, who is a very early English cardinal of the first part of the 19th century, when the two met in the Vatican in 1833, Newman had asked Wiseman 
on what terms the Church of England would be received back into the Roman fold. Wiseman replied, famous words, by swallowing Trent whole. This has now been accomplished on behalf of the Anglican Communion. Only the issue of women's ordination stands in the way of merger, or rather, takeover by the Church of Rome. Whether such an outcome as this, such success for the Counter-Reformation, was envisaged by those who determined the agenda at Kiel isn't known. But most of the facts and solemn warnings that I've referred to must have been well known to the evangelical leadership. But at Kiel, warnings of this kind were brushed aside by Dr. John Stott, who chaired the conference. He and the other leaders were set on accommodation with the Anglo-Catholics. Earlier, in 1963, a skirmish had been fought by these progressives with those who held fast to separation from doctrinal compromise. The Anglo-Catholic ritualists succeeded in a court action in making mass vestments and stone altars lawful, unthinkable a century earlier. As a result of this, many reformed evangelicals departed the Church of England at that time. Their loss made the task of those who were set on accommodating the Anglo-Catholics at Kiel that much easier. John Stott warned the assembly at Kiel that evangelicals had, quote, acquired a reputation of narrow partisanship and obstructionism and that they needed to repent and change. The initial task for divided Christians is dialogue, he said, sounding very reasonable, at all levels and across all barriers. We desire to enter into this ecumenical dialogue fully. We recognize that all who, quote, confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior according to the scriptures and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that, that is in fact the World Council of Churches position, basis, have a right to be treated as Christians and it's on this basis that we wish to talk with them. This statement made clear that the Kiel Conference was accepting that not, not only Anglo-Catholics and liberals uh, were to be accepted as fellow Christians, but Roman Catholics too. Let us just pause and consider the enormity of this. 34 years ago, the Church of England's most widely respected evangel evangelicals, headed by John Stott, determined that all Roman Catholics are saved. It is interesting to note that it was another 27 years before leading evangelicals on this side of the Atlantic did the same with evangelicals and Catholics together and later on the gift of salvation. The influence of Billy Graham and his new evangelicalism played its part at Kiel. Graham's apparently hugely successful ministry had long, had long since accepted Catholics and liberals as fellow Christians. His example in Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones's words quote, of Christian fellowship without agreement in the truth of the gospel had shaken people's convictions as to what exactly it means to be an evangelical. The sea change in the evangelical attitude to ecumenism ratified at Kiel by Anglicans greatly influenced the other denominations. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones probably, or perhaps over here I should say perhaps, the greatest preacher of the 20th century, led the opposition to the departure from Protestant evangelical, uh, evangelicalism that Keel represented. Lloyd-Jones believed that far from providing the solution to the main problems of the church, Keel left the church with much bigger questions to answer. 
What is a Christian, for example? And what is a church? The abandoning of the stand of the reformers against counterfeit Christianity and the downgrade of doctrine implicit in the Keel statement meant, in fact, that true unity among evangelicals was no more. Addressing the British Evangelical Council in 1969 and citing the scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who would prepare himself for the battle? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones made clear that he saw the enemy as not just present, but rampant in the camp. Sound the alarm, he thundered. Sound the alarm. Opposing the new unity movement was a lonely task for him. So many of those leaders who had previously shared his views were shifting their position. For example, according to Ian Murray of the Banner of Truth, Dr. J.I. Packer, once so very close to the doctor, changed his view between 1963 and 1965 to the very position that he had once criticized as inconsistent with evangelicalism. His endorsement of the Keel statement was a telling blow to Dr. Lloyd-Jones and others with whom Dr. Packer had previously allied himself. It was only a very few years before, in 1961, that Jim Packer described the doctrine of justification by faith alone, sola fide, as, quote, like Atlas, it bears a world on its shoulders, the entire evangelical knowledge of saving grace. But his position on this defining doctrine changed as well, perhaps at that same time prior to Keel. His revised view has been recently demonstrated by his, signings, by his signing of evangelicals and Catholics together, the document that has rocked American evangelicalism. In a 1994 article, Why I Signed It, he refers to sola fide, faith alone, as, quote, small print. He asks the question, may ECT realistically claim, as in effect it does, that its evangelical and Catholic drafters agree on the gospel of salvation? Answer, yes and no. No, Professor Packer says, with respect to the small print. Thus, sola fide, a burning issue for Reformation martyrs, and an issue which bears a world on its shoulders is relegated to small print. Martin Lloyd-Jones felt that by compromising with ecumenism, Anglican evangelicals were putting their denomination before the gospel and downgrading doctrine. Personal relationships and superficial unity, tolerance and love were preferred to the, confrontation, the confrontational truths of scripture. He urged evangelicals to come out of the denominations united in the truth of God's word. How this was to be accomplished, he felt was for others to determine, but he was convinced that it could happen and should happen. There had to be clarity rather than the confusion that was overtaking the understanding of the gospel. We should not be asking, he said, how can we have a territorial church? How can we have unity and fellowship? Or how can we find a formula to satisfy opposing views? We should be asking, what is a Christian? How does one become a Christian? How can we get forgiveness of sin? And what is a church? Keel legitimized compromise for evangelicals within the established church. But at Nottingham, 10 years later, Nottingham being also in the center of England, just uh, perhaps 20 miles north of Keel, at Nottingham, the second national evangelical conference, NEAC II, in 1977, gave compromise its seal of approval. The ecumenical charismatic movement, which had begun in Britain, 
so I beg your pardon, it began here, but it had begun in Britain in the early 60s, had been opposed at Kiel by that conference's organisers. But at Nottingham, it was highly praised. The Nottingham statement declared, we see a particular significance in the charismatic movement, especially in its strong witness to the primacy of God. And it was at Nottingham that leading British charismatic David Watson, friend and mentor of John Wimber, spoke of the Reformation as one of the greatest tragedies that has ever happened to the church. He went on to tell the conference how he had come to sense the profound grief of God that, 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 he, that God must feel at the separation of his body. The charismatic renewal movement had begun in the United States in the 50s, in the 1950s, and rapidly swept across the Christian world. It was widely seen as a great work of the Holy Spirit, a new Pentecost, parachurch groups within the, within the movement, like the Full Gospel Business Friends Fellowship International, brought Roman Catholics and Protestants together under the banner of love in what they called the unity of the Spirit. They placed great emphasis on experiential testimony rather than the scripture. It was less than two years before Kiel that the Second Vatican Council gave its blessing to what they called this new movement of the Holy Spirit. The separated brethren could now be welcomed back into the fold, announced Jesuit Cardinal Augustine Beer, one of the most uh, uh, senior uh, prelates in the Vatican in 1965. The heretics had now become separated brethren, and their abandoning of sound doctrine meant that they could come back to the Mother Church. The Vatican officially adopted its own renewal movement. To what extent this movement was spontaneous or planned, we do not know. But with all the emphasis on gifts and experiences, it certainly helped to sweep aside doctrinal differences. At the same time, it demonstrated, as did the Billy Graham Crusades, what the evangelists called, quote, the role in the Christian family of our Catholic brethren. With the reinstatement of Catholics as brethren in the minds and hearts of so many, the once secure fortress of biblical separation was breached. Kiel was the formal surrender to the forces of new evangelicalism. Nottingham made that surrender unconditional. The momentum from Kiel and Nottingham and from the new evangelicalism seemed irresistible. The new spirit of tolerance and love outlaw outlawed arguments over biblical truths. Unity through compromise of doctrine was sought as the will of God to transform the church. The great doctrines of grace and reform theology were seen as the province of those living in the past. Welcome tonight. Fighting the same old irrelevant battles behind crumbling ramparts. Conservative evangelicals who would have no truck with ecumenism were simply marginalized, being seen as unloving and intolerant. The decision by the Kiel Conference of a majority of evangelicals to dialogue with ecumenism was of immeasurable spiritual significance and consequence. It was extraordinary that such a momentous change could be brought about by those very Christians best placed to understand its implications and without serious protest too. In a very real sense, evangelicals had ceased to be evangelicals. Doctrine had been relegated from the position of supreme authority to a lesser position. The high view of scripture was abandoned. God's word was no longer infallible. The part played in this by the acceptance of modern Bible versions in place of the King James was surely very considerable. <coughs> Thus saith the Lord was allowed to give way to, to depending on what version you have, 
reminding us of the serpent's seed of doubt. Has God said? From Kiel, the slippery slope has rapidly led us downwards and we see the consequences today in the Church of England and in the other Protestant denominations in Britain as well. During the past 30, 34 years, there's been such radical and profound change in the Church of England that this once great institution seems to have lost its very identity. The collapse of Protestantism at Keele and Nottingham had sold the past to the new evangelicalism and accelerated the downgrade of doctrine, the abandoning of our God-given Reformation heritage enshrined in the 39 articles and formularies of the Church of England has removed the ancient landmark which our fathers have set. That's Proverbs chapter 23. The scripture from Joel chapter 2 verse 17, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them, Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Where is their God? That question is now very re relevant to our national church in England, to its bishops, its priests and laymen, so many of them so uncertain of their faith. It is a question that the nation is asking of itself as that once august body that many of us can remember falls further and further into disrepute. At Keele and afterwards, the ancient landmark was removed and our heritage was given to reproach. And we're reaping the whirlwind now. Our constitution is being dismembered by uh, our present government, which is likely to be re-elected in the next couple of weeks. And. Uh, it does look very likely that we'll be subsumed into a federal United States of Europe. Anyway, I'll come back to that later. There was an act of betrayal. The legacy of those who gave their lives for the truth of the word of God was abandoned. The verdict of Keel and Nottingham was that the martyrs of the Reformation were mistaken that they were party to one of the greatest tragedies that ever happened to the church. For all but a very few in the Church of England, the flame of Hugh Latimer's candle was extinguished, the blood of the martyrs denied. The same is true in the free churches. Free churches are no longer so free. Indeed, they are no, no longer so non-conformist. There is conformism, a new kind, conformism to the spirit of the age, the spirit of tolerance and unity. We've seen even the Bible-based Baptist denomination in the United Kingdom succumb to this seductive spirit, carried along by the stream that became a river that flowed from Keel. The Baptist Union gradually moved its position until in 1995, it routed those who remained in opposition and voted overwhelmingly to fully participate in churches together in England, the ecumenical instrument, as it's known, where I come from. The new evangelicalism prov provides for love at the expense of truth. But this is not the expression of love of the bride of Christ, but rather of the harlot of Revelation 17. What has become of the love of truth, the jealousy for purity in doctrine? Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. And the hatred of idolatry. Where is the urgent console, concern for the souls of more than a thousand million religious Catholics, as well as Orthodox and Anglicans, in the ecumenical church today without assurance of salvation in bondage to the sacraments and to a system of works and ritual where are hearts of compassion for those who seek truth and are imprisoned by deception 
Where is the cry for the cleansing of the church and for deep repentance because we have failed them, our own kinsmen, by pretending not to see? Where today are the preachers who do not persistently avoid the clear message of Revelation 17 or the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians 2 and the mystery of iniquity or the persecuting little horn of Daniel 7 identifying the, the uh, Antichrist wearing out the saints of the Most High. Where are the watchmen who sound the alarm? Why do they who hear the sound of the trumpet not take warning? The fact is that in our land of such a precious heritage, very few pastors are prepared any longer to call to remembrance the sacrifice of the martyrs of the 16th and 17th centuries. They're forgotten. The cause of these martyrs, of denying the sacrifice of the mass as an appalling blasphemy, and the identification of the papacy as antichrist, that cause is now the preserve of the very few. The Reformation provided Christians with two great truths. The just shall live by faith and not by the works of Romanism or of any other religion. And that the papacy is the Antichrist as revealed in Scripture. If we lose the second, we unquestionably do injury to the first. And that is being amply demonstrated today. Pastors won't preach it. They fear the disapproval of men. They should fear the disapproval of God. Political correctness reigns supreme in the church of all places. Few there are who scorn popularity and are ready to lay down their reputations, repent of their reputations before Almighty God, let alone their lives. But as Edmund Burke and Matthew Henry said, evil abounds when good men stay silent. At his enthronement as Archbishop of Canterbury in 1991, George Carey, who's still Archbishop of Canterbury, spoke of the example to us of former archbishops who were martyred. He named the Benedictine monk Alphege, and he named Thomas a Becket, both of whom were canonized by the Roman Catholic Church. And then he spoke of William Lord, I don't know if I'm stretching your knowledge of English history here, but uh, both Becket and Lord sought to bring the Church of England under the authority of the Church of Rome and into her faith and practice. And that was why it was safe for the new Archbishop of Canterbury to talk about them at his inauguration. Conspicuous by its absence from George Carey's recollection of martyrs at that time was the name of Thomas Cranmer, the Protestant martyr, whose quincentenary, 500th uh, an anniversary, had been commemorated in a very muted manner for a short time before. George Carey's enthronement involved a commitment to upholding the 39 Articles of Religion and the Book of Common Prayer. And one of the articles, uh, 39 Articles, is still that uh, the sacrifice of the Mass is a uh, blasphemous fable and dangerous deceit. But still our archbishops and bishops put their hand on their Bible. I don't think their thoughts are entirely focused uh, and uh, swear something or agree to something. I, I don't know. I haven't ever witnessed it. The present archbishop's commitment to the articles in the prayer book has been borne extremely lightly during, the last, during his uh, first decade. During his latest visit to the Pope in the Vatican, George Carey did have some good things to say in defense of the Reformation, but he continues eagerly to seek full unity with the Roman Church at the same time. This ambivalence illustrates and epitomizes the leadership problem of today's church, man-centered and totally inconsistent. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians, 
So say I now again, if any man preach any gospel other unto you other than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. The consequences of surrender to ecumenism at Kiel and elsewhere have been very apparent to our nation as well as the church. Given such a free hand, the Church of Rome, with its mastery over the media, has been positioning itself to take over when the Anglican Church has disintegrated beyond recall. And to us on the outside, that's, that seems like an imminent event in the making. To what extent the Church of Rome's agents are assisting in this process is, of course, not revealed to us, but history relates very clearly what lengths the Pope's followers will go in order to further the cause of the Mother Church. Britain's leading Catholic newspaper, the Catholic Herald, is now confident, en confident enough to predict, quote, the days of the Anglican Church are numbered and most of its worshippers will return to the true faith of their distant medieval forebears. Many of them have already returned, at least in spirit. A few years ago, the Times and the Daily Telegraph both, both gave front page coverage to the news that the Church of England had arranged for the return of relics of St. Thomas a Becket on loan from Rome where they were sent for protection at the time of the Reformation. Fragments of bone and brain tissue, they are the first relics to be displayed at Canterbury, Canterbury Cathedral since the Reformation. And just before I came out, uh, there were some relics being uh, paraded in Northern Ireland of all places, a very Christian place, um, with uh, beautiful coruscating caskets, bejeweled caskets, containing the relics of St. Teresa of Lisieux, um, carefully flown over from France with loving care, paraded in the streets, and they were on our main BBC News bulletin, and that's at the time of a general election. So, well, it just makes you think more about the mastery of the media, which I mentioned. The public perception of Thomas a Becket's life and death has been greatly altered in the last ecumenical century by plays and films like Anglo-Catholic T.S. Eliot's Murder in the Cathedral, even more so in relation to Sir Thomas More, who, according to Fox's Acts and, Monument, and Monuments, scourged and tortured in his garden quote, those guilty of reading the scriptures and holding purely Protestant doctrines. Robert Bolt's film, A Man for All Seasons, which has established Thomas More as a great and godly Christian man unequaled in his faith in Christ, is based on history rewritten, ecumenical propaganda simply. A year of England's Christian heritage began in May 1997 with a celebration of the 14th centenary of St. Augustine's arrival in Britain. At his inauguration, the Archbishop of Canterbury said that Augustine had brought Christianity to the British Isles from Rome. Well, what he brought was not Christianity, but it's not correct to say that uh, his arrival uh, was anything like the first arrival. It's, it's again ecumenical propaganda. So there's a wealth of evidence that Christianity had taken root in these islands at the end of the, in, in our islands, at the end of the first century, and that saints of Christ, such as Patrick and Alban, were martyred or persecuted for the sake of the gospel centuries before Augustine arrived to enforce that papal uh, supremacy. It was right at the beginning of the Christian era that uh, Christianity started in the British Isles. 
That 1997 year of uh, so-called Christian heritage was said by its organizers to herald a fresh spiritual breeze and a religious stirring. It featured numerous pilgrimages celebrating pre-Reformation saints. The veneration or worship of saints and relics is reversion to spiritism and necromancy, which are condemned in the Bible. But their practice is consistent with the Pope's recent advice to his flock, quote, to call on dead ancestors for protection. The accelerating reversion to pre-Reformation Christianity, to superstition and idolatry, is supported strongly by well-respected Catholic columnists such as Paul Johnson, who have prayed all their lives for England to be restored to Mary's diary. Roman Catholic Church believes that England was and is Mary's diary. The press has given extraordinary prominence to, to uh, very prominent uh, politicians, editors, and even a member of the royal family during the last few years. So much has been made of these conversions in our media. And yet, in this ecumenical age that we now live in, it's not supposed to matter. Multi-faith worship has followed on not unnaturally. For once the gates are thrown open, all may come in. Reflecting this, the leading members of the royal family have embraced other religions. The Commonwealth Day service, especially dear to Her Majesty the Queen, is no longer recognizably Christian at all. And she has not listened to the protests of 2,000 evangelical clergymen concerned about the insult done to the unique claims and supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was Prince Philip who in 1989 launched the International Sacred Literature Trust to significantly contribute to interfaith dialogue. And Prince Charles, the heir-in-waiting, whose allegiance is to faith rather than to the faith, has gone out of his way to encourage Islam. The Muslims are planning to build a hundred new mosques in the next few years and describe this project and this project is described as the biggest expression of religious faith in Britain for centuries. In November 1992, the Church of England Synod deferred to the prevailing politically correct view and voted in the measure to ordain women. Dr. David Samuel, who resigned his ministry in the Church of England as a result of the adoption of the measure, described something of his reaction at that time. Quote, this was a decision that would have enormous implications and would set the course and direction of the Church of England for the future, and that course would be one of ever-increasing divergence from Scripture, from its formularies, from orthodoxy, and from truth. If the official doctrine of the Church of England can be changed arbitrarily, by a show of hands in the Synod, then it has been undermined and revealed to be a fiction. It is likely that within a few years there will be women bishops in the Church of England and women archbishops as well. Once evangelicals allow compromise to enter in and fail to stand their ground on the rock of Scripture, continuing retreat is inevitable. It is well known that leading evangelicals, including John Stott, convince themselves that there is no literal hell. Now, just a few years later, the doctrine of eternal punishment has been, quote, officially abolished by the Synod of the Church of England. Annihilation, annihilationism is the reformulated doctrine of the Anglican Church flying in the face of 2,000 years of orthodoxy and the plain teaching of our Lord in Scripture. Another de decision of the Synod is that cohabitation before marriage is now no longer living in sin. The teaching of the New Testament in relation to fornication 
is crystal clear. But this is the new hermeneutic and the new evangelicalism. With the synod legislating against the clear teaching of scripture, there must have been many who were reminded of the psalmist's question, if the foundations be removed, what will the righteous do? Pulpits are physically disappearing from Anglican churches, stone and other altars reappearing, crucifixes abound, roods are returning, as are confessions and holy places and holy water, and more and more ministers are styled as priest and father, contrary to scripture. The law is rarely preached in the church today. In the new ecumenical climate of live and let live, preachers do not want to run the risk of offending their congregations and losing numbers. It is sobering to learn from the press that a recent survey has revealed that less than 25% of Anglican vicars now know the Ten Commandments even. Without the law, how does one properly preach the gospel? There is within the Church of England uh, the reform group of Anglican evangelicals who formed, who formed it uh, themselves in order to oppose much of what has been agreed at Keele, and they expressed disillusionment with the post-Keele post direction of the church by advocating non-payment of part of the parish's share of the diocesan bu budget. But they continue today to oppose uh, some of the unbiblical uh, trends in the Church of England, but not all. And they haven't opposed the ordination of, of women measure, and they've compromised over ecumenism. So that really leaves in all of the uh, Church of England just one group headed by presiding Bishop David Samuel, whom I've already mentioned, the Church of England continuing, uh, who uh, use the uh, authorized version of the Holy Scriptures, um, base their, their faith, as uh, um, all Anglicans once did, on the 39 Articles of Religion um, and the Book of Common Prayer and the Ordinal, all of which are thoroughly soaked in Scripture and the highest authority, of course, the Word of God. And uh, they need our prayers, the continuing Church of England. They're very few in number, but they are contending for the faith and uh, fighting for truth. In bringing this uh, brief survey towards a conclusion, I feel I must just speak about to you about uh, the very real danger, uh, again, both spiritual and political, that confronts us um, as our government moves behind the scenes to weaken the polity of our nation, uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and Northern Ireland, and prepare for us to join the single currency. There'll be a referendum about that if uh, this uh, Labour government is re-elected, and cause us to be just, well, England would disappear um, in the proposed the proposed changes that would take place. Uh, we would be four or five provinces along with Scotland and Wales and subsumed into a super state called Europe. To what extent the retreat of Protestant evangelicals epitomized by Keel has been responsible for the drift into abandoning our cherished independence. I must say as a boy, I, it would be more inconceivable than anything else I could think of that we would just willingly hand away our independence after a thousand years. But as I've sought to argue, our precious and God-given heritage has been betrayed. The lessons of history and the far-sighted precaution of our forefathers in protecting our liberties are still, though, enshrined in the Bill of Rights of 1688 the Act of Settlement, uh, which uh, relates uh, to the uh, identity of the, monarch, the monarchy and defines the Protestant throne, the monarch, at the moment we have a queen, must be a Protestant. She's sworn, she swears, each monarch at the moment, swears at, 
at the uh, accession oath, I am a faithful Protestant. And later on, I will maintain the Protestant reform religion established by law. Now, it's very questionable uh, whether Prince Charles will do this because he's already said that um, for him, it's faith that matter and not faith. So it doesn't all go well. But uh, it'll be very hard for this government or any other to dismember our very complicated constitution with all these acts sort of joined together, including the Act of Union with Scotland, all of them based on scripture and on our Protestant heritage and on, uh, uh, on our Protestant experience uh, of the dangers of uh, leaving any possible opening for the Church of Rome to make a comeback. And if they uh, want to repeal all this complex legislation, it will take them probably months, if not years, because they've got to do it not just in England, in Britain, but also in Australia and New Zealand and Canada and South Africa and many other Commonwealth countries, dozens and dozens. And uh, they, they won't, they, it won't be so easy, but we'd still value the prayers of uh, American Christians because uh, they at uh, breathtaking speed in what they are doing. We know that as a nation, we deserve judgment. The defection of evangelicals from their Protestant reform legacy has not surprisingly paralleled that of the de defection of the monarchy and our parliament. And I say it again, at her coronation oath, Her Majesty recognized the authority and supremacy of Holy Scripture. When she became queen at the ceremony, she was given the Bible by the uh, moderator of the Church of Scotland, I think it is. And uh, she repeated the words, this is the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. She then promised to maintain to the utmost of her power the laws of God, the true profession of the gospel, and the Protestant reform religion established by law. In other words, she committed herself and the crown in parliament to upholding the statutes and laws of holy scripture and the Christian faith. However, during her reign, we have seen her royal assent given to radical legislation totally opposed to Christianity as revealed in Scripture and plainly fostering immorality. Bills facilitating divorce, legalizing abortion and homosexuality, as well as encouraging adultery and pornography, have laid the basis of today's moral, cr moral crisis in our society. There are many signs that we are reaping this whirlwind of God's righteous anger and judgment not least the latest plagues we've had with BSE and, uh, and foot and mouth. And uh, Bishop Ryle wrote about a judgment. Uh, he wrote a brilliant paper about judgment of Britain by foot and mouth in the, in the 19th century. What we are seeing unfolding at breathtaking speed is the withdrawal of the grace and blessing of God that many of us have come to take for granted as a result of our national apostasy. As a nation, we may be about to pay a very heavy price indeed. Our religious liberties are at stake. I've mentioned the danger from Europe. Um, Adrian Hilton's uh, book, uh, which is right up to date in the second edition, The Principality and Power of Europe, speaks of the uh, possible nature of this judgment, where we're going to be delivered back into... Uh, pre-Reformation type Christianity and political dominance uh, in Europe by Rome. Evangelical Christians are already classified by the European Union as a sect. In fact, there's some legislation going through in France at the moment, and um, I believe there already has been in Belgium. Uh, and any group that doesn't belong to the majority church which in almost every European country is Roman Catholicism, is viewed by many members of parliament in, in the uh, European Assembly with suspicion. 
This classification is nothing new. The early church was branded as a her an heretical sect. And this was the earliest basis of persecution. Of course, any impending persecution will not be on overtly religious grounds. An enlightened European Union would consider this to be abhorrent. Persecution will be political, as it was with the early church, with accusations of disturbing the peace or inciting sectarianism, as in the book of Acts, chapter 16 and 17. One MEP has confirmed that a European resolution on sex and cults permits the newly forming European police force, Europol, to carry out surveillance on such group, groups' activities. He adds, in Europe, this could include Christians. With Protestantism's surrender, apostate Christendom is swiftly unifying world religion, which under its veneer is, in, is as is as as is uh, as as is as intolerant, I beg your pardon, and bloodthirsty as it ever was. Once religions of the world combine with the new age to form one great ecumenical and multi-faith monopoly, God's little flock will yet again be as lambs to the slaughter. Bishop Ryle's words encourage those evangelicals who will not compromise. Quote, this is the church which does the work of Christ on earth. Its members are a little flock and few in number. One or two here and two or three there, a few in this district and a few in that. But these are they that shake the universe, who change the fortune of kingdoms by their prayers. These are they who are the active workers for spreading the knowledge of pure religion and undefiled. These are the lifeblood of the country, the shield, the defense, the stay and the support of any nation to which they belong. Let us be encouraged, therefore, and stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free and yield not again to the yoke of bondage. Amen. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available.